The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Uh, kia ora and welcome to The Fold. I'm your host Duncan Grieve and I've got a real, I, I feel like this is a real special episode. My guest today is Laura O'Connell Rapira, but before we get to her, I want to um, give it up to our first ever sponsor. I'm so stoked about this. When I started this podcast, basically being on a year ago, I was like, is this going to be a thing? Like speaking about the media in, in kind of nerdy and earnest ways, I, I, I don't know if there was necessarily an audience for it. It's, it feels like it's starting to happen. And the fact that Vodafone have recognized that is uh, it really brings joy to my heart. So they're, they're a great company. They have been supporting, you know, they're on a, sort of a journey of their own uh, under new CEO Jason Paris and they've um, supported the spin-off and, and made possible a whole bunch of really great work and now they are supporting the fold which enables me to do it more frequently and you know take it into new places so the fold is proudly supported by Vodafone with innovation made simple and world-class network technology Vodafone will help maximize the potential of you and your business Find out more at vodafone.co.nz and honestly, you should do that. Like that, this the the Vodafone of old is is, is kind of being blasted apart. I, I went out there and uh, talked to a bunch of their sort of like network engineers and technical people around the launch of five G and the people and the technology that they have is is kind of head spinning. Like just the lift, like there's this this bus sized thing inside a Faraday cage where they were testing the 5G tech and it just, it kind of boggled my mind and, um, you know, makes you realize this this future thing, it's it's hurtling at us very fast. Anyway, on to my guest today. Uh, Laura is, she's the outgoing director of the independent crowdfunded community campaigning organization Action Station. She co-founded uh, Rock and Roll a few years ago, which aims to get young people into, enrolled to vote, basically. I mean, I... I've always been quite fascinated by her and by Action Station because I didn't really know quite how to categorize them, you know, like they they sort of were, you know, part activist, part community organizer. They were had a fierce perspective, but they weren't political as such. And there would be times when I'd go like, you know, six, six, nine months without really thinking about them. And then they would sort of explode onto the agenda carrying an issue with them whether that was the whether it was sort of uh, mental health public media campaigning to make Matariki a a public holiday but as you'll see from this conversation they have had just the most extraordinary impact on New Zealand these past few years which for a real you know a member-funded grassroots political organization is it's not a small thing and because they're multi-issue and because they're sort of the 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 issues are sort of generated from their own community. They, they invariably walk into areas where they're established by as often, which receive government funding, and you know often are doing really good important work. But there's something about the energy or, that they bring and the style um, p- with petitions and these sort of public inquiries. It's just a very different, very modern way to go about things. And I think so much of that is the the intellect, the clarity of thinking, the kind of moral force of Laura herself. She talks about, you know, and reflects quite well on the things that worked and things that maybe didn't work as well. But, I mean, honestly, I think the big thing that I took away from the conversation is that there are just so many signal moments in, in the past few years in New Zealand where it felt like the society was in motion and moving into a kind of more progressive direction and just one that that kind of was more comfortable or realistic about reckoning with it, its past and the sort of work it needs to do to try and unwind some of the the sort of the social issues that that have bedeviled it for for 
decades, for generations. And, um, you know, she would branch at the idea that she was, you know, like at the heart of this thing. But honestly, listen to her and try and, you know, try, try and view it differently. Um, so, and she's got really interesting things to say about the media, about social media, about the way that they related to sort of party politics and, and what the sort of founding ideas theories of change of, of Action Station was. So it's it's a bit of a different one, but I really love it. And yeah, this is uh, Laura O'Connell Rapira. Uh, kia ora and uh, welcome to The Folds, Laura. Thank you for having me. Um, no, it's, I'm, I'm really pleased to have you. I feel like you're kind of a little bit outside of what I normally do here, and that's exactly why I want to talk to you because I think that the media has been informed by and changed in some ways by the role of sort of community organizing and, and activism and uh, in, in ways that it maybe hasn't sort of necessarily acknowledged. And so I think it'd be really interesting to get your perspective on that. But um, and I do want to talk about the gig you're moving to, but I'd really love to, to start with with your sort of path to Action Station, like you've been director or co-director for, for over four years now. What what was, how did you get there? So I didn't go to university because I didn't really know what I wanted to get in debt for. And so I decided if I was going to get in debt, I was going to travel. And, um, and I was living overseas basically for a couple of years. And I returned to New Zealand in 2013, really hungry for, for contributing, I guess, to Aotearoa. And I signed up to do this social enterprise accelerator program because I was like looking around and I was like, ah, capitalism seems to be doing quite well. Maybe if I can work out how to do this business thing and, you know, use that to create good in the world, um, that could be quite successful. And during that social enterprise accelerator program, um, I heard about some folks that were starting up Action Station with the vision to sort of return people power to democracy. Um, they were burnt out by the formal parliamentary politics. They'd been quite heavily involved in party political organizing and wanted something that sat outside the those power structures but held those power structures to account. And so I was really interested in that. I contacted the people who were founding it and I mm. more or less sent them campaign ideas until they hired me, um, which is quite a successful way to get a campaigning job is to campaign for it. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and then it's just been so Action Station is part of a global sisterhood of organizations around the world. There's 19 organizations who um, operate independently of one another, but share a common DNA. And that DNA is that we use the internet, which seems really like, why would you not these days? But it was quite novel at the beginning of this, of this model. Um, we're multi-issue and we are some form of people powered. So quite often sort of traditional NGOs will um, fundraise from a large number of people so that a small number of paid staff can do the work of changing the world, whereas Action Station and the rest of the organisations that are in our sisterhood, they um, treat people as folks with influence and networks and skills and time and talent. And so we ask people to send emails, sign petitions, turn up to events, organise their own events, run their own campaigns, etc, etc. And so being tapped into this global sisterhood meant that we could learn a lot about what worked in other contexts, what didn't work. And it meant that we've been able to go from zero to a hundred, I would say quite quickly. Yeah. It's been a, a wild and, uh, and very enjoyable journey. Yeah, it, it, it does. I mean, it, and the, there's always that difficult thing, right? When you're starting something that's new, people, especially like you're in a new space and, and operating in a different style, people don't necessarily kind of know how to categorize or interact with it. Did you find it kind of difficult to sort of establish relationships with, you know, sort of external parties and so on when, you know, in the early years of the organization? Yeah, and I, I think we're still trying to do that because Action Station is multi-issue and because the charity and NGO and community organization sector is sort of a lot of them are funded by government and government tends to speak about collaboration but then fund competition and so there's quite a scarcity model um, or scarcity mindset rather um, in the not without good reason um, you know community organizations rely very 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 heavily on the volunteer labor mostly of women who give their time to you know make these services and these um, and these organizations happen 
And so there can be some territorialism, is that a word? Um, there can be, can be right. some guarding of territories. Yeah. <laughs> and because and because we're multi-issue and we're rapid response, meaning that we operate at the intersections of, of high uh, visibility and high actionability, meaning that, you know, if something is being shared like wildfire, a, a new story is being shared like wildfire, that suggests that there is energy there that can be tapped into and harnessed and pointed in a direction where hopefully that energy can, cre can create social change and so I always talk about the anecdote of you know a, a typical action station member sort of sitting on the bus reading a news story feeling really angry about that news story and then not really having anything to do with that and in an ideal world they would get an action station email shortly after reading that news story and says hey I read that article too I'm really annoyed about it here's a petition that we can all sign and that's only the first step what we do after the petition is you know what grows into the into the campaign and so every time we go into a new area of work um, there are people that we sort of have to prove ourselves to is in terms of being a value add. And so a lot of the There's a lot of that, patch um, protection in New Zealand, right? Yeah, there is. And um, and we were like one of the lessons that we got from our international sister, from our from our Australian sister organization, which is quite a competitive political landscape and quite fierce, actually. And um, when I remember in the early days of Get Up as our sister organization there um, being set up, they would basically just go into an issue that people had been working on for five or 10 years and then rally up some support, um, do a bunch of stuff in the media and then claim the victory for themselves. And we were like, we don't want to do that because we'll see those people later on at the pub because New Zealand's <laughs> small. And so we knew from the outset that we didn't want to take that approach. We wanted to have a really collaborative approach from the, from the get go and that relationships are everything. And so we've done a lot of work to prove that we are a value add to folks who are doing that sort of long term um, mahi to create change. Yeah, which makes sense given New Zealand scale and how easy it is to alienate yourself. One thing which you know you, you said at the start and I think has always been interesting to me about Action Station is the extent to which it really does feel like being nonpartisan is quite important to you and that does also feel like a bit of a change from a lot of the sort of you know, there has been a lot of alignment with, with parties, with the, um, particularly parties of the left, um, historically with, I guess, organisations that seek to influence. That you, know, they, you tend to get bound up with the party, but often it seems like that is a, can have the function, it doesn't begin that way, but it can have the function of kind of quelling a, a voice. And I think that ability of Action Station to be quite strident and it critiques of parties that nominally at least would sort of uh, at least have outwardly similar values. Uh, you know, how important is that element to, to your posture? I think it's really important. I think it's key. We're very clear that the power that Action Station draws from comes from, it's very jargony, but we call it an outsider power theory of change. So our ability to influence political change does not rely on having good relationships with um, politicians. There are some folks who do rely on that sort of thing and that's a viable theory of change. Lobbying you know, behind the scenes has been extraordinarily effective at influencing policy and practice in New Zealand. But I, I wrote about it actually once for the spin-off um, talking about this great analogy that uh, Daniel Hunter writes about call, uh, talking about how a politician is like a balloon tied to a rock and um, you can swat at the rock as much as you like and it will sort of swing to the left and to the right but ultimately it will always return to where the rock is um, and the rock is people's activated social values it's the everything that the public is willing to accept is in the rock and our job is to shift the rock as much as possible so that politicians follow suit and we've been very clear about that from the very beginning and I think it served us really well we did have some folks who doubted us because of course we came to we came into being um, under a national government and folks thought that we just set ourselves up so that we could change the government to a Labour government but I think we've more than proven that we're willing to hold the Labour government to account as well. Yeah I think that you know if anything the sense of sort of dissatisfaction has I don't know increased over the past few years or even you, you can kind of sense it in recent weeks that that's one of the the sort of dangers of having an absolute majority is you know if you're not doing something you, you can't point at a coalition partner, it's because you don't want to or you don't know how. In terms of your relationship with the media or, or how um, media, in my sense, 
you know, obviously as a as a journalist and, and now someone running a media organization is that the tenor and tone of media coverage of the kinds of issues that Action Station tends to sort of seize upon and, and campaign on has changed quite markedly in that time. Mm. But obviously I'm very much in the weeds of it. As someone who is kind of close to it but not in it, does that does that scan to you too? Yeah, we when I took over as the sole director of Action Station, um, I made a pretty conscious decision to pivot our energy towards the decolonization of Aotearoa. Um, and I mean that in, in every, in the broader sense of the term. Um, we we made a bunch of fundamental changes. We bought in uh, we bought in place a co directorship uh, sorry a co chair model for our board. So on our board we have a Tangata Whenua representative um, as a co chair and a Tangata Tiriti representative as the co chair. We changed our constitution so that it reflected honouring Te Tiriti or Waitangi rather than the Treaty of Waitangi because of course those are two different documents with two different meanings. Um, and then we also decided as part of our strategic direction that we were going to pivot our energy towards supporting indigenous led change. And so that pivot meant that we said no to some campaigns and said yes to others. And so, for example, we said yes to raising funds to support the peaceful resistance and occupation at Ihu Mapau. We said yes to supporting the campaign to make Matariki a public holiday. And that I think having that very clear mission um, has has really helped us and it's also been quite it's caught, it's been with the zeitgeist of the moment because there are a lot of young people who are um and older people but there are a lot of young people who are really interested in decolonization and what it means and so it was also yeah recognizing that there was a sort of growing trend and in tapping into that people power i mean that 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 sort of sense of being well aligned with a, a kind of a generational change in perspective and and values like i'm old enough that i've got uh, three three daughters and the like the level of you know, politicization that can feel out of even like six and eleven year olds and that it's not a you know that which is you know would historically have been characterized as oh, that you know these kids what, what are they knowing but now now you can almost feel like there's a there's like this kind of moral force to it in a way that that adults you know, the people, or older people are kind of sort of, I don't know, they're, they're responding to it in a different way than they might have yeah. 20 or 30 years ago. I think um, that's, yeah, I definitely think that's true. And like I, prior to Action Station, I started and ran a campaign called Rock and Roll, which was about uh, combining music and community organizing to get more young people to vote. And um, uh, that was like a real uphill slog. Like millennials were actually really hard to galvanize and get political. But this next generation under millennials, the Zoomers, I guess they're called, um, or the Generation Z, um, they are so active. You know, they're the ones organizing the school strike for climate. They're the ones organizing the Black Lives Matter rally, which is the biggest rally that's happened in Wellington in a decade. And so, yeah, I'm really loving this generation that's coming up and um i remember at the black lives matter rally james shaw he was like oh this reminds me of like this is this has got a real like 70s vibe to it in terms of like a generational shift of highly politicized highly informed and sort of active empowered young people uh taking a stand for a range of different co-copper which is really cool yeah it, it, it does you know it is it's, i mean I, I was you know only born right at the very end of the 70s but all of the the way that <laughs> the boomer activism was has so kind of drenched kind of culture since you it it's the first time you've seen kind of things which look and and feel like that as um an indigenous person and an, an organizer how did those those black lives matter protests or or you know assemblies feel and and particularly having you know witnessed the what what happened in the US US in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd yeah, I think well, I th what I thought was, I remember being at that rally and walking at the front and um, and there was a chant that was that was taking place and it was like, black is beautiful, brown is beautiful, everyone is beautiful. And there's just something really powerful and, um, and I don't know, uh, spiritual, I want to say, um, in terms of connecting with, you know, tens of thousands of, like 20,000 people were in that, were in that march yelling something like that in the streets of Wellington. Um, and I think more than anything, it helped people of color and indigenous people feel less alone. Um, we, as you know, racism is the water that we swim in. It's, um, it's embedded into our institutions and our structures, you know, from school to the workplace to parliament. 
And so it's just it was just really validating and reassuring to know that there are so many other people who experience these sorts of things and are doing what they can to bring about a world in which people, all people, regardless of the colour of their skin, can be free. Do you feel, like, I mean, as you referred to before in terms of the way that you, there was this kind of bone deep, embrace of tertiality uh, within action station do you and, and given the like that span i mean it's, it's five six years but my sense is that society has moved it, its perspectives have moved quite considerably in in that time do, do you feel like you know as you now look back on that time and action stations work and the work of other sort of people in your space has has played a role in you know or do you think it has been successful in starting to kind of have a more I guess a more honest conversation and and kind of reckoning with I guess you know like these kind of historical sins and and where where the country needs to to move yeah I do think so I would I would say that the advancement of conversations around what it means to truly honor Te Tiriti or Waitangi though sits less with the work of Action Station and maybe more with the work of the folks who put together the Matiki Mai report. So Matiki Mai was headed up by Margaret Motu and Moana Jackson in 2012 to 2015 and they travelled around the country to 250 hui to speak with more than 10,000 Māori about what our vision is for the future in 2040 and what came out of that was a resounding call for constitutional transformation, um, constitution meaning a set of rules and values and principles that we all agree to abide by, and transformation meaning changing all of those rules. And what they say is that um, by 2040, Māori need to be making decisions for Māori in a way that's in line with um, Māori thinking, Māori values, and Māori ways of being and doing. And that process of, you know, that that is a sort of uh, a, a process of alignment to our Māori. And so we at Action Station have had the benefit of working with lots of those Māori who are involved in that project and helping to, to, to realise that vision. And our work is very much geared towards supporting, bringing constitutional transformation to life using the skills, the networks, the ideas, the time talent that we have. And so I would say that we've been able to contribute to that, but we're one of many. And the reason that that um, has been moving along, I would say, sits with Moana Jackson and Margaret Monty. When you look back at the campaigns over your time um, as director or co-director, uh, what, what are the ones that, that sort of stick out where you feel like the result, whether it's like a sort of defined thing <laughs> or a, a kind of a national mood, um, mm. hit, you know, that, that really feel like they, they sort of hit the hardest or did you know work, work the best? I would say that there are three campaigns that I think have been the most successful or the the most have contributed to progress um, and sort of shifting the rock. The first one is mental health. In 2016, I believe it was, uh, Jonathan Coleman, who was the health minister at the time, he there was an announcement made that he was going to be cutting funding to Canterbury Mental Health Services, citing a lack of demand for services as the reason for that cut in funding. But of course, we know that national have an ideology of small government and the pri privatisation of services. And so it was likely more to do with the ideology than it was actual people's need. And so we launched a petition that quickly grew to 10,000 signatures because um, he made that announcement like pretty close to the anniversary of the earthquake, which was a really poor move on his part. And so there are a lot of hearts and minds already thinking about Christchurch. And um, and then we our theory of change was basically if we can keep this issue in the media headlines beyond the sort of initial cycle of outrage, then we think that we can get Jonathan Coleman to change his mind because it's an election year next year. And politicians obviously want to win votes and they want to be seen to be responsive to the public. And so our whole strategy was geared towards keeping the um, issue in the headlines. And so the way that we decided to do that was to focus on human interest stories. And so we asked the 10,000 people who signed the petition if any of them had stories they'd be willing to share about their need for mental health services. And I think it was about 30 or 40 people came forward and we ended up working with about five of those folks to pitch their stories to radio or the press in Christchurch and to also make a social media video with one of the folk about it. And that was back in the day where you could get like some organic reach on Facebook. And so we made this really heartfelt video about this mother's experience of her son who still needed specialist mental health support. And that quickly racked up, you know, 30,000 views or something like that. And everything I'm describing basically happened in the space of about a month. 
And I think it was five or six weeks later after that initial media story, Jonathan Coleman announced that he had heard the public and he was not going to cut funding. He was actually going to increase funding by $20 million. And so that led to what eventually became our people powered inquiry into the mental health system, where we used the same formula. We collected 500 people's stories and experiences of the mental health system put it into a report with a bunch of recommendations and then drove a media campaign around it. And that report was the first piece of recommended reading to the actual mental health inquiry that got set up by the government. And the folks who were on that inquiry said that they don't think we would have had that inquiry were it not for our inquiry first. And it's quite rare in campaigning. You get that kind of direct feedback that because you did this, that ended up with this. Um, usually it's much more sort of ethereal than that. And so it was really nice to have that very direct line between the mahi that we did and, and the outcome of that. And of course, the mental health um, inquiry of all of the government-led inquiries is the one that has had the largest number of recommendations adopted. It's had 38 out of the 40. And that's not just because of action station. A lot of people have been active on mental health for a really long time, but I know that we definitely contributed to, to that happening. The, the second campaign I would say is the Make um, Matariki a Public Holiday campaign. The reason that was really important and worked well is because it built on the legacy of mostly Māori who had been doing the work to revitalise Matariki for you know, 10, 20 years. And it was really making the most of, of the rapid response model when it works best, which is we saw a moment for action and we galvanised people to seize that moment. And that moment came about when Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said, um, we're thinking about putting in place more public holidays as a way to stimulate domestic tourism because of COVID. And that was in May. And of course, Matariki was in July of that year. And so we were like, okay, well, we want Matariki to be one of those holidays. And so we launched a petition. We delivered that petition, you know, six or seven weeks later, had 30,000 signatures by that time. Um, and, um, and it was also after COVID when I think people, or after the lo first lockdown where people were wanting something nice, they just wanted something nice and so it also tapped into the to the mood of the nation at the time and then the third campaign that I think has been an ongoing campaign for us and continues to be a an issue that we will that we'll keep pushing is around welfare reform we have been working on trying to get government to increase benefits in New Zealand since 2015 and in 2016 we and others were successful in getting a $25 increase which was the first increase since 1989 and then um, you know the Labour government increased benefits again by $25 last year I think it was which is great but that's still you know a couple hundred dollars short of where it needs to be and so that's going to be an area where we keep pushing we keep pushing we keep pushing but it's a massive uphill battle because we're dealing with 30 years of punitive rhetoric and punitive policy and you know this sort of division of uh, the so-called deserving poor and the working poor which really only serves the capitalist class and so that's going to be an ongoing area of work for us and in, including with this government at the moment. It's interesting that yeah, because the the first two there were sort of defined outcomes. So the third, in some ways, you know, with the with the government's welfare reform, you know, when so few of those recommendations were taken on, it's it's interesting that you single that out as a success story. Is that more in terms of the not necessarily what it, you know? I guess there are those concrete achievements in terms of you know, that money is even if it's short, it's still something tangible and and would have made a, a huge difference to those who received it. But I guess there there's also that sense of a you know a body of work that continues to to be available there um, yeah I think the success is like more internal maybe for the movement so like as some of your listeners may have seen we um just uh, had 70 charities and community organizations come out calling for benefit levels to be increased by Christmas and that's I would say the first time that I've seen that kind of level of unified you know a chorus of calls from a diverse range of organizations all singing from the same song sheet and that has not been without effort um that has taken a lot of behind the scenes relationship building nurturing and eager massaging and things like that to get to that point and so yeah i think i think that's what i guess why i point that one out is that is that i feel like that 30 years worth of punitive policy and rhetoric is coming to an end because the sector is much more ready to push it to the point where it becomes inevitable. Move the rock. Yeah. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa, with over 4,000 out of home advertising sites nationwide across both street furniture and retail centres. I'm super grateful to O Media for enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. 
Skinny are helping you show how smart you are with the 1Q Quiz, an all-new, super-challenging and super-quick daily quiz built by The Spin-Off. Every Monday, Skinny are giving you the chance to prove you're smart with the Skinny Extra Credit question. Get it right and you'll get the chance to score yourself some Skinny Extra mobile credit so you can text, call or even video call your group chat and gloat about how big your brain is. T's and C's apply. So what what other... You, you didn't mention it and, and my sort of... Certainly this is something I'm close to and have been, I guess, not confused by, but there's certainly been a lot of sort of policies announced and very little kind of enacted from the government is is on the media front. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know I, I gather that the Save Campbell Live was a was a huge part of the, the that sort of explosive growth of Action Station yes. in terms of the... Because there was such a visceral public reaction to it. I mean, that was, wasn't actually public media, at least not in the, the traditional sense. But it um, mm. it certainly, I guess, made people understand that you know that the media isn't just going to to hang around forever. And some of its institutions, or you know, whether they're people or um, you know, platforms, stations, are, are less secure than they might appear. Do you want to mm. talk about that that moment, and then about the the kind of the, the sort of inquiry you had and the bizarre in some ways lack of action on, on media from um, the, the Labour government? Yeah, that, oh, I loved I loved being a part of that campaign to save Campbell Live because I remember, I think Action Stations, so Action Stations mailing list now is something like 450,000 people. It's like huge. Um, but it used to be about 2,000 people when I first started and I remember we at the beginning we would just launch various petitions as a way to grow our list and grow our power and grow our funding base actually because when you have more funding you can hire more people and you can do more work and so Campbell the petition to save Campbell Live I remember that took us from I think 30,000 people at the time to 80,000 people it doubled our membership like overnight and it was wonderful for us because the folks who like Campbell Live are exactly the kind of people that we would love to be Action Station members they love John Campbell Campbell's work because they loved his work on child poverty or they loved his work around, you know, uh, the Pike River mining. They loved his work around Christchurch earthquakes. They just loved him and the work that he did across a multitude of issues. And those are the kinds of folks we wanted to be um, in our membership. And so for us, it served us really well. And then, but it was also really nice for us to like show our aroha to John. I remember when we organized alongside some social work students from Unitech out in um, Henderson, a, a, a little hikoi to, with a banner that said Save Campbell Live. And we took it to, to, the, to the TV station. And I just think it was really nice for us to be like, John, you've done so much for us as a country. We want to show you how much we love and respect you. And so on a personal level, it felt really nice to be a part of. Of course, we weren't successful in that campaign, although he said, Seems like he's doing all right and um and what they ended up leading to were two things one is it led to a campaign that we ran in partnership with they used to be called the coalition for better broadcasting and now they're called better public media trust to increase funding to rnz or to unfreeze funding because i think at that time funding to rnz had been frozen for yeah like nine years the whole of nationals term basically and of course we know that when there is a healthy well-funded public interest media democracy works better because people have access to the information that they need to make informed decisions and to hold politicians to account and other folks in power to account and so on and so forth and so that was one of the campaigns that we ran and that was somewhat successful and that did help to get a little bit more funding to rnz but of course not as much as um as we felt was needed and the other thing it led to, as you mentioned, is an inquiry. And so we decided to replicate the flag consideration committee or panel, whatever it was called, where we basically brought together six six different uh, experts from a wide range of, we tried as much as possible within the budget we had from a wide range of uh, expertise and, and knowledge of, of um, public interest media and broadcasting. Bill Ralston, Lizzie Marvelly, Kay Almers. Um, and then so we, there were six of them we traveled around the country to I think it was six different towns or cities to hold public meetings where we talked about what needed to happen to uh, improve the state of public media and broadcasting in New Zealand and then we also collected online submissions and then we put all of that together we put it into a report a bunch of recommendations and we delivered that to Claire Curran who was the spokesperson on this issue at the time while she was in opposition and things were going well because then she was when, once the government changed she was the person in the position to be able to actually bring to life the recommendations that we had made but then of course she got caught having 
coffee um, at Astoria Cafe and um, and things went and then things went wrong for her and that and our campaign sort of stopped there, which was a very interesting reminder for us of our theory of change, which is that we were relying on Claire to make the changes once she was in that position as opposed to focusing on shifting the rock, which is making sure that the movement is constantly calling for uh, well-funded public interest media um, uh, and holding whichever minister happens to hold the purse strings and the power on that to account and lifting their aspirations and their gaze and so on and so forth. So, yeah, we often... um, we often have those kind of lessons at Action Station where we're like, oh, we strayed from our true path and it didn't work out the way we wanted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds, yeah, almost quasi-religious when you, when you put it like that, but uh, <laughs> it's a sense of mission, right? Yeah. Um, so now you're giving up this, I mean, on some level, it sounds like, you know, with your, you know, with, with who you are, with how, how you view the world and what you want to do in it, it seems like a, a dream job, but you've, resigned from it to take a new one. Do you want to talk about why you felt like it was time for you and what it was about this new role that that um, sort of excited you? Yeah, so I've I've been approached a couple of times since being in, at Action Station um, being asked if I would consider applying for other roles and none of them felt right. But when I was approached by the CEO of the Foundation for Young Australians, I was at least compelled to consider it. And the reason I was compelled to consider it is because my passion has always been working first and foremost with and for our rangatahi, for young people. And Action Station um, is a broad-based movement. Like our our theory of change um, is around bringing people together from different backgrounds around the values and the vision that they share and then activating their unique talents and abilities um, in a way that, that collectivizes them. Uh, to create that change and um, and I've loved being a part of building a broad-based movement um, but uh, it is um, it is it is not the same as working with and for young people first and foremost and so that was one of the reasons I wanted to consider working for FYA um, but then the, a couple of other things happened during that time um, I was, I mean, obviously as part of my role, I pay attention to the news, not just in New Zealand, but around the world. And a new story came out around a mining company called Rio Tinto um, blowing up a 46,000 year old sacred site, um, sacred indigenous site in Australia. And um, that story broke my heart. And I was just like, I feel like things are going in the right direction for um, for the realizing of indigenous sovereignty in Aotearoa. And I feel like our whanonga in Australia are miles behind. And I and I basically, you know, I was I was I remember sitting by the ocean and I was just, just sort of silently meditating on what it is that I should do. And I realized that um, one of the reasons Action Station has been successful in what we've done is because we were able to learn from international experience and um, learn about what works, what didn't, adapt it for our context and sort of run with it. And that made me think about how there are some experiences that I've been lucky enough to have and some folks that I've been connected to here in Aotearoa that if I can connect them to youth movements and um, youth leaders and Indigenous young people in Australia, then hopefully it will help them and their kaupapa and their work to, to realise Indigenous sovereignty over there. And so a lot of why I'm going over there is because I want to better connect young leaders and youth movements between Australia and New Zealand and then eventually across the Pacific as well. We have a really uh, rich opportunity, I think, in terms of being part of this of this region of the world. And with COVID as a reality now and our, you know, the, the likelihood of people, you know, spending lots and lots of time going back and forth to Europe or the United States seems... Um, seems unlikely as as such a like common pathway for the future. What would it look like for more young people and youth movements to connect across the Asia Australia Pacific region, um, share their learnings, second to each other's organisations, share you know templates of what's of what what has worked, what hasn't, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. If we were able to do that, would it lift all of our waka at the same time? That's sort of my hope, um, and yeah, that's why I'm I'm going over to take up this role. <laughs> that's a uh... It's not a small thing, um, but <laughs> based on based on your last five five years or so in New Zealand, I feel like Australia and Rio Tinto needs to watch out. Um, thank you so much um, <laughs> for 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 coming on the fold today, Laura. And um, yeah, we'll we'll be watching 
what what happens over there and and how you carry on your mahi in that sort of bigger and and I think you're right to identify like a a very large area of need over there. That was The Fold, brought to you by our partners at O-Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Huge thanks to O-Media for sponsoring this episode of The Fold and enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Kia ora e te iwi, te Aihe Butler here, podcast manager at The Spin-Off. If you enjoy listening to our podcasts, consider supporting our mahi by signing up to become a Spin-Off member at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.